you join me today at the wheel of an astonishingly rare Italian car. I love an Alfa, but I've never even seen one of these in the flesh before. Today, I'm driving an Alfa 90. Proud to be sponsored by Diamond Bright, the car care products that have been keeping the furious fleet looking their best for a long time already. To find all you need to keep your car clean and protected, follow the link below to diamondbright.co.uk. This it's a 1985 Alpha 90, and it's possibly one of the rarest Alfa Romeos I've ever seen. There are about 10 in the UK, and this is the only one that works. It was only built from 1984 to 1987, and it's only sold in the UK in 1985 and 1986. And even then, only with one engine option. So why is it so weird and why is it so rare? Let's take a look. So in the early 80s, Alfa were, as usual, out of money, and they needed a new car to replace the Alfetta because that had been on the market since, well, 1972. So it was a good decade old. And looking a bit you know old hat by that point even though it was a great car but they had no money to invest in anything else so they went cap in hand to the government because they were state-owned at that point and so they had a bit of money to do something with what they had and that did make a silk purse out of well not a sow's ear a silk purse out of an old silk purse really so they took the basis of the Alfetta which was front engined quite small and transaxial rear which is a great basis for a car however they couldn't do anything about reforming the internal structure they were stuck with the dimensions the frame much of the internal work so they used some of the alpha 6 um, parts as well so they put the alpha 6 bulkhead in it kind of the alpha 6 transmission tunnel even though there's no transmission in it it's a weird hodgepodge of things and to make it look exciting and interesting and different they went to their old friends Bertone where it was reskinned with an interesting very 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 1980s style look at these straight lines running front to back there's blockiness everywhere in some ways it looks like the 33 kind of styling family look but in other ways it's nothing like anything else in the alpha family range so Marcello Gandini at Bertone had to take the internal dimensions and fix hard points of the old Alfetta and do this with it, turn it into a car for the 1980s. So it's very narrow and quite short for an 80s executive luxury car. And inside it's extremely luxurious but very narrow. Interesting. But most excitingly though, certainly for us in the UK, is here under the bonnet. Now although we've only got this engine in the UK, there were actually five different motor options in this car. Over in Italy, they had two versions of the twin cam, a 1.8 and a 2 litre, both brilliant engines. They also got the V6, but in 2 litre form, because up until 1993, there was a 38% VAT charge on any car with an engine bigger than 2 litres. And there was a 2.4 litre VM diesel, which is similar to the thing that wound up in the Range Rover back in the 80s and 90s. But in here, in the UK, we got the good one. We got the 2.5 litre V6. This is the ARO 1646 2496cc V6 engine fitted with Bosch L-Tronic fuel injection which makes 154 horsepower and 210 newton meters of torque. This is the motor out of the GT6 and of course what the one it actually came out of is the Alpha 6 which is the biggest thing that the Alpha 6 donated to this project. The thing only weighs 1090 kilograms and that means with that much power this will do 126 miles an hour. I will just add I got my weight of this car, 1,090 kilos, from a book which is the famous 100 Years of Alfa Romeo, written with help from Alfa Romeo. None of these four weights here in any way are close to the weight that I've got. The styling of this car is surprisingly, not bland, that's the wrong word, but plain for an Alfa Romeo. We have got some traditional things. We've got the Alfa Romeo heart, the Cuare Sportivo, the sporting heart here at the front in the centre of the grille. And there were various grille options depending on the year, the engine version. And after 1986 they were revised into what they called the Super Range which got a different number of slats in the grille. But there is some interesting alpha quirkiness. You can't have an alpha without some weirdness going on. In this particular case, if you look down below this oh-so 80s bumper and square front end, you find this little lower lip, which is actually active aero. And this lower splitter actually moves. It's active airflow. And above 50 miles an hour, damped by a telescopic damper filled with wax, apparently, um, this float drops down and diverts flow into the engine to aid cooling. Bizarre and brilliant. And the rear of the car is a slightly odd, square, blocky shape. It's so, so 1980s, the way it's just lots of angles. It's almost like built out of Lego on graph paper, which was so much the thing back in the early 80s. And look at this huge cutout for the uh, number plates around. After the facelift in 86, this did become body colour. But here in 1985, that's still black. And look at this full width 
a red line of lights with the inserted reversing light. This is just brilliant. And can you see this down here? The swan neck exhaust pipe like you find on things like the Rover SD1. All the cool cars had it back then. And look how high this boot line is though. It's just a massive slab. And this isn't a black bumper. It's actually just very, very dark brown. Now I'm gonna show you inside the boot, but I can't do that from here. I've got to walk back inside because there's a bit of weirdness with that as well. Now, one of the idiosyncrasies of this car, and there are many, is that they didn't bother changing the left and the right hand layout of the seats. So the driver's seat on the right hand side of a UK car is a left hand driver's seat of an Italian left hand drive car. So the boot release attached to the driver's seat is down here in the middle by the transmission tunnel. The other thing you can notice is the driver's footwell heel pad is also present on the passenger side because they didn't bother making left and right hand drive versions of the carpet. Right, this boot is hanging down quite low because you'll notice these support springs which are designed to hold the, the uh, boot open and up which is a common design feature of almost every car in the world however unlike most other cars in the world where when the boot is shut they're under compression and not stressed on this car when they're shut they're in the stretch position so they wear out in the boot droop shut genius genius like an italian genius bullet now there's lots of other quirkiness here as well you'll notice the uh, jack is strapped to the furthest extremity of quite a long boot. It's a good sized boot, I and mean, if you have business arrivals who you need to be taken care of, you can fit maybe two of them in here quite happily. Although this lip is just so ridiculously high, you will struggle to get them into this commodious boot. Um, this car does come with a broom attached, so any gags in the comments about alphas and rust will be not kindly received. This car's got a few very nice original details on it. For example, this dealer sticker from Mario Deliotti in Birmingham. I didn't know even there was a, such an exotically named Italian car dealer in Birmingham. Sounds like a racing driver. We've got the number plates from the same dealer as well, front and back, still original, so these need to be saved. Now, something you may notice of this badge down here is the cloverleaf. It's a gold cloverleaf. Here in the UK, we only got the absolute top of the line version of the car with a two and a half litre V6 and the rear electric windows. I can't stop without mentioning these door handles, which are the least practical handles you've ever seen. You think you're going to pull that, you don't. You push the middle bit and the door springs open. Now the interior of this car is typically special and Alfa Romeo. They always do an interesting interior, which makes you question everything you've ever done in your life. This one is clad in this beautiful, very hard wearing velour, nice little kind of dotty pattern, very regular and geometric. And that matches the crazy speedometer, which is the thing I'm gonna start with. I don't normally start on the speedo, but in this case, I'm going straight there because it's too good to ignore. This thing is just insanity. It's a maths teacher's nightmare or possibly dream, I don't know. We've got multiple colors of graph paper mixed with diagonal slashes and a digital readout and a clock and other digital LED reader. It's just mind blowing. Uh, it's quite clear, although not very accurate. Uh, apparently you have to actually use the digital readout for the speed rather than the interesting graph line because the graph line is not very accurate, but the number is. I don't know why. Apparently, if you're doing 30 miles an hour, set to miles an hour, and you move it over to KPH, it will display 913. Well, that's just one of the many interesting quirks of this car, but not all the cars got this. So a lot of the basic cars of so the 1.8, for example, only got ordinary standard boring needle dials. Uh, who wants those? They're so 1970s. This is the future. This is the 1980s. On the left hand side of this whole graphy thing, we've got three more subgraphs. Fuel, water temperature and oil temperature, which are all green LEDs which move left to right like a BMW service indicator light. So very, very, very futuristic. You can see this stuff on, on Doctor Who or something. This is just madness. Let's move over to the door into our usual beginning of the walk around. The door is just mad. It looks like a cross between the Pompidou Centre and the Lloyds Building. The top is hard plastic. And the armrest is hard plastic as well. And the whole thing moves a little bit if you push it too hard unsurprisingly. The same velour as in the seats is cushioning the door. Looks very nice indeed. But it's just so angular, so square, so slashy. This is everything about the 1980s, which was brilliant in a door. The door handle pull is solid, square. It's not even nice to hold. It's just such a big square thing, but it looks amazing. And it goes down into this big, slanted, going fast, even when it's standing still, loudspeaker cover with a tiny cutout. But this little tiny, actually cast metal door handle, which is barely like three centimeters square. It's tiny and you have to give it quite a pull because it's such a small item. 
and this is all integrated into this kind of matching design flourish of lines running front to back. And ahead of this, you will find a little nubbin which electrically turns the door mirror on the passenger side. There's no switch to move left to right door because the driver's side one is a manual little nubbin up here. That's electric, that's manual, which is better than a lot of cars in the 70s and 80s, which gave you an electric driver's side one next to where you're sitting and a remote manual one you had to lean over for, which was stupid. This was good. There is no door pocket though. There's nothing down here in the bottom at all to give you any kind of uh, storage. It's just nicely carpeted to match the kind of greedy brown I'm gonna call it kind of baby diarrhea brown carpet. It has got the floor heel kick thing in both sides because they didn't bother making two versions. It was such a short run car. Then we move across to the actual full on dashboard, which is a sea of angles. It's stepping back into the distance. It's like perspective on a dashboard. The big square binnacle is angled at you looking very fierce and futuristic. Rubbish T-shelf, it slopes away from you. Rubbish T-shelf, it just falls onto the floor. Rubbish T-shelf, it just drops into the footwell. There's no T-shelf in this car at all. I didn't even bother bringing a cup because there's nowhere to put one. Ugh, fail, this is a minus five on the T-shelfery of this car. And I was expecting so much from an Alfa Romeo, my favorite brand. I even wore my 145 T-shirt, which I can't show you without <laughs> getting undressed. Um, however, we do have multiple air vents. We've got a, a dual stack air vent on the two sides of the dashboard. One is angled at 45 degrees with the dash top going at the window. The other one is kind of 90 degrees, well, 89 degrees pointing out into the body of the car. And we've got two massive vents here in the center flowing air like it's going out of fashion. Moving back to the wheel, the wheel is a thing of utter beauty. It's properly Italian racing car-ish. A slim leather rim, three hard metal spokes, very, very square and angular, and this big, soft nubbin in the center. Let's do a horn test. Oh, it's a two-tone, two -tone, but I didn't get two tones then. It should be a two-tone, but it won't two-tone it. James, you need to fix one of your tones. <laughs> You need to, yeah, it needs town and countries. That's the town version. There is a country version coming. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe even country and western. We got both kinds of music. Over to the right of the instrument binnacle, we've got a panel of little warning lights, indicators, um, lights on, that kind of stuff. But you cannot see any of it because the rim of this beautiful wheel is blocking it almost in its entirety. And below that, we've got a kind of a computery readout Alfa Romeo control panel, giving you warnings about doors open, lights, parking brakes, the alternator charging or not, that kind of stuff. All the important stuff that really does matter is blocked not only by the, the spoke of the steering wheel, it's also blocked by the wiper arm. So you really have no chance of knowing if the car is going wrong. In the mirror position on the left, we've got a couple of other little dials and switches. Uh, curiously labelled with pyramids in white and yellow, so who knows what they do. It, it uh, alerts the aliens or brings the Egyptians or something, I don't know. I think actually it may channel uh, your inner, inner mystic and puts a large pyramid over the car with a razor blade under it to sharpen your razor blade and slow the rusting. Who knows? Um, and we've got two stalks here, both matching with beautiful slender arms and little round drums knurled at the top. The one on the right hand side, as I say, is for your wipers and typically of an Alfa Romeo, it's confusing in its operation. You have to drop it down and then turn the end uh, because, because Alfa. And then it's, there's no check stops on it, it just turns randomly. The one on the left, is the indicator, that's fairly normal. The uh, lights on is fairly normal. For a click, turn it to illuminate and flash. That's normal-ish as well. If you want to turn the headlights on, you hit the horn button on the end, but it's not actually sprung loaded to turn it off again. You have to manually pull it out, which is, yeah, actually takes a more force than you imagine. Over in the center of the dashboard, there's nothing up top, just a little gold cloverleaf badge to show you're in the best car in the range. Underneath, we've got a little tiny Bosch clock with minute little buttons and a panel of buttons for the front and rear fogs, rear screen heater, virtually impossible to find, has the warning lights. Next to that, the same size as this entire panel, great big ashtray because you need that. And then below it, enormous dials for your heating and ventilation, the HVAC, uh, the usual kind of stuff. Now this is where it gets very interesting because we have got a panel of three switches, which looks like it's gonna be the electric windows, but it's not. It's the electric seats because all these cars came with electric seats in the V6, which is fantastic. But the controls, as I say, are down here in the center of the car, randomly next to a cigarette lighter. If someone had optioned a uh, radio, that would also be down there, but they didn't. 
This car has got a five-speed manual gearbox in it, which has got a very strange feel, which we'll talk about more when we're on the road. Over to the left. Now, they were struggling for a USP with this car because it was fitting in, replacing the Alfetta and the 6, but it didn't really have a strong image. They didn't really know what they were doing with it, and the 75 was coming, and they needed to do something to make this car stand out from the crowd as the executive car of choice. And what does an executive need? A briefcase, because because you do. So this thing is, instead of having a glove, well it has got a glove box, I'm not saying instead of a glove box, there's a tiny weenie glove box just big enough to put in, well barely enough for anything really. Um, you've got this, so you can take this with you, you can hold your, oh it doesn't open even very easily, your Alfa Romeo documents, your owner's manual and service records, or you can put your important meetings, or in the absence of a tea shelf, you can put your biscotti and your coffee in here and carry it to a picnic away from the car. Now believe it or not, these things are kind of a collector's item and go for thousands of pounds now. This is absolutely insane. It's worth about a quarter of the car here in the glove box. Now here we get into another area where they were perhaps struggling for inspiration or they just, I don't know, been watching too many airplane films and like the idea because we've got an aircraft inspired handbrake. It's like on a Vauxhall Zafira, but I think the inspiration would have come from this, not from the people carrier 25 years later. So to release it, squeeze a little handle inside, down it goes, actually clipping both front seats as it passes. But yeah, we've got this lovely aircraft inspired handbrake and underneath it we've got this weird concertina top cupboard little cubby hole. This car is just so inventive with its solutions because a regular opening lid wouldn't open so I had to hinge it in the middle. Very, very clever I suppose. Now above us we've got the aircraft theme continuing because no sunroofs were available as options on this car because we have this beautiful Alcantara line ceiling which is absolutely gorgeous. You can sit there and stroke the headlining which is not a thing you say very often. Above you in the center line of the roof there's this full length console which houses a weird green selection of courtesy lights so your night vision isn't obscured by opening the door in the dark. Uh, we've got our spotlights in the front and this is very interesting just like on an aircraft we've got a panel of buttons above the driver ready to turn on the turbines and the engines power up engine one two and three and four. We've got all four electric window switches up here so the driver and the front seat passenger can command the ones in the back as well but they don't toggle up and down like the windows. There are arrows showing up and down but they toggle left and right which is uh, interesting. And of course we've got switches for the internal lights, glowing green. One or two if you want, or all three if you're feeling brave. And of course a little spotlight up there. And then finally there's a power cut off to the back windows. What a great car. This is just insanity. I love it. Let's have a quick look in the back. Despite its diminutive dimensions, this is kind of aimed at the executive market. So the rear seat is really deep and comfy lots of well actually surprising large amount of knee room and foot room so you're not feeling too penned in here it's quite narrow it's a three-seater but it's about as wide as a current well early generation new mini so you're barely wide enough to fit people in. but like in the front we've got a panel of aircraft style consoles push one in the middle straight off the with a campari for you you have two little spotlights and you've got the electric window switches down in the front we've got a 12 volt lighter socket well sorry cigarette lighter because it's the 80s little ashtray Curiously, we've even got zip-up pockets in the back in case, I don't know, you're driving inverted and don't want stuff to fall out. This is a kind of weirdly placed car in the market because you can tell it's designed as a driver's car, but it's an executive car, so there's the possibility that maybe you may be chauffeur-driven and sit in the back of your car doing important executive stuff because you've got your briefcase in the front and your buttons in the roof. It's very odd, but these seats are very comfortable. There is a centre armrest, or oh, there's a centre armrest. Ah, which must be retracted during landing. Ah, comfy car. Well, the car starts instantly. It's fuel injected, so it's not going to struggle really. Now a gear shift. Oh, listen to that. A lovely V6 Busso engine. One of the all-time greats. Now this gear shift, though, is very strange because the linkage goes all the way from here into the boot, or well, under the boot, sideways, and then forwards again into the transaxle. So it's, uh, yeah, a little bit rubbery, and apparently quite easy to get the wrong gear, if you're not careful. Oh, this thing rides nicely. Okay, I'm on MPH, so doing, oh, okay, both the 
both wheel outs do seem to say about 35 miles an hour at the moment. That's, that's positive. Oh, it's very light and soft on the road. A lot, a lot of pedal travel, like a crazy amount of pedal travel on the brakes. And the owner of this car has waxed it to within an inch of its life. I realize it isn't in perfect condition. I mean, the interior is fantastic, but the metalwork is 0.8 of a millimeter thick and was not well um, treated at the factory. And in fact, I believe they went outside across from one building to another at one point. So it was exposed to the elements during production with no paint on it. So uh, surface rust is common on these cars. an Italian V6 engine. Surprisingly grippy, it's a little bit damp out today. I say very damp out today, but it's surprisingly good grip. It's got new, uh, brand new tires on it, so that's understandable. Now it's interesting and as nice as this car was, the 90 was basically doomed from the moment of its inception because it was kind of only a stopgap until Alpha could bring out the 75. Wow, this thing turns well. So it was announced and released early in 1984. But in late 1984, Lancia brought out the Thema, or the Thema, which was a completely new car. It was larger, it drove well, more, more in a more modern fashion. And it was based on a completely new shell as well. So that started stealing sales immediately from the poor old 90. And of course, the final death sentence for it though was the 75, its own stable mate, which came out in 1987, at which point sales for this car just fell off completely. Down. It's a decent heater in this car. Now, that amazing handling comes courtesy of the Alfetta. It may have been old, but it was good. It had the Dion tube in the rear, which is an amazing suspension setup, which keeps the rear wheels always facing vertical. So it's very, very planted and great for road holding. And at the front, it had double wishbones, hydraulic shock absorbers, and a torsion bar. So although the ride is fairly soft and it does lean into a corner, the car really does grip nicely. It just flows over bumps. This is a trick Alfa Romeo have always had. They could always build a car which felt too soft, too comfortable to be a performance car, but at the same time just absolutely gripped and really gave you a great ride if you were trying to push it through a fast road. It is a small car and it feels small on the road. It's 4,392 millimeters long and 1,638 millimeters wide, which is really, really little. For a four-seater executive car, that's absolutely tiny. And as well as that clever suspension setup, it's also got disc brakes all round, vented discs on the front. You know, this was a proper performance car. only just got hold of this car a few weeks ago and has already made a few improvements to it and he's going to be gradually improving it over the next few well, years I guess. Um, the car has got a few spots of surface rust on it but it's a substantially solid car um, which is amazing because potentially it could have been so bad. I mean interestingly for example in the rear uh, passenger door shut, they didn't actually bother painting it, just, just got undercoat on there, no, no silver paint. And there weren't that many colour options on this car. There was blue, alpha red, light beige, metallic champagne, 
metallic mid grey, which this is, and metallic opal, which is all, all very uh, dignified colours, very executive, not very Alfa Romeo, not very scarlet as you might expect. The one downside of this magnificent V is that it's a little bit thirsty. Probably it gets about 20 to the gallon, which is not a lot, and the fuel tank is really small. So you only get about a range of about 150 miles or so. switch on the top of the uh, dashboard which lets you switch it from MPH to KPH suddenly leap from 48 to 68 miles an hour because obviously in Ares where they built this car in Lombardy they use kilometers not miles an hour well thanks for joining me today in this absolutely astonishing unicorn of a classic car this thing is just amazing, such a brilliant car to drive. I've loved every minute. If you've liked this, please hit like and subscribe and the usual sort of YouTube stuff. Smash those buttons, as they say. And I'll see you again next time driving something completely different.